So I'm going to start by just asking, <laughs> by just asking the three of them, um, what brought you to this place? I don't mean to Shomri Tor in particular, but what I mean is, Avram, you are in your second to last year of rabbinical school. Michelle, you have decided to, um, at this point in your career, um, become part of the Jewish people through informal Jewish education. And David, while you started in rabbinical school, you are now in cantorial school, almost complete as well, in your second to last year. So how'd you get there? Um, we'll go starting with David and go down the line. Okay, so I am a student at JTS, cantorial school, which if you know JTS, it's not in Los Angeles. Um, and I'm also not commuting, really. I am a holdout. Um, I'm still in Los Angeles. Most of my colleagues are now in New York, but I, I joined Cantorial School uh, during the pandemic when distance learning was a must. So um, I'm happy to be able to do uh, this uh, one more, uh, this second to last year of school in, um, in Los Angeles. And I actually, um, prior to Cantorial School, I attended Ziegler Rabbinics for two years um, and decided to switch my path to Cantorial. And how did I get to rabbinical school? I, I, I wanted, I had a, a, a hunger for it. Um, so uh, that's how I got here. That's my path. Yeah. Michelle. I'm Michelle. I grew, did not grow up in the valley or at this synagogue or at Temple Aliyah, but I grew up in the city in the Pico Robertson area going to Temple Beth Am and Pressman. I went to Shell Habit for high school, went to Camper Ma my entire life, even up until this past summer. Um, so being in the Jewish world has always been a really big part of my life. I studied psychology at the University of Maryland, and so I really enjoy people and working with people and kids and teens. Um, and I was working in a school la last year um, in an elementary school in Studio City, and it was not a Jewish school, but I really enjoyed it and also felt like something was missing in my life, and I knew I wanted to be back involved in the Jewish world and what that looked like exactly at the time. I didn't know. I couldn't have been able to predict that I would be in this role now, but I'm very thankful to be in this role and combining my passions for Judaism and youth. Um, so that's how I got here. So now that, now that I'm in year five of this, it's on, it's on great. So now that I'm in year five of this thing, um, eat the mic, is that, okay, great. So now that I'm in year five of this, uh, this whole rabbinical school thing, being here seems a little, little less strange uh, and definitely more comfortable. And still, I'm still a little surprised that I'm here uh, because I, did ex I didn't expect the rabbinate. Um, and it's something I ran away from for a long time. I mean, in, in an alternate reality, I'd probably be in a, uh, in a physics program somewhere. That's what I did my undergrad in. For many years, I was really focused on I'm going to be an academic, and I'm going to get poor eyesight from reading too many research articles and be hunched over in a lab, and that's not what I'm doing. And I'm here because I had experiences where I was able to be honest with myself about what are the things I was interested in, what are the things that I wanted to do, um, how I wanted to spend my time. I had teachers and I had mentors that shared with me their experiences, and saw the things in me that I couldn't see because I was too close to me, if that makes sense. And it was a process. And it took time and it took a lot of honesty. And I'm so happy that I'm here. Because when I'm here, I feel like I get to be the version of myself that I want to be. And I get to put out into the world the things I want to put out. Okay. Um, you, we're going to invite you, if you have follow-up questions, to have follow-up questions in just a few minutes. And Natalie has a microphone, 
So if you are interested in jumping in and asking um, one of the members of our staff a question, just raise your hand and Natalie will come over and give you the mic. So that way everybody here can hear and everybody online can hear. Um, before I do that, I just want one or two more questions that I'm going to ask. And the first question is, um, was there, is there a Jewish book um, or an author who has greatly influenced you, your thinking, your decision-making process, um, your desire to be where you are and what it is that you're doing in your career? Or was there a Jewish book that just right, really resonated with you and transformed you in some way? So we'll start with Avram and work our way back. So gr growing up on the East Coast, I had never really heard of Ziegler. All I knew was, was JTS. And I, I knew there was another school out on the West Coast, but that was the West Coast. And here I was stuck in Jersey outside of Philly. And as things would go, I heard about Ziegler. And somebody said, a good friend of mine actually, oh, you need to read Rabbi Bradley Shavit Artson's books. Specifically, you have to read Renewing the Process of Creation. And this was right in the thick of my tension between science and religion and like what my worldview was or was not. And that book came to me at a time where I was really engaging in those big questions. And... For me, I found in that book a path towards constructing a theology and a worldview which was both spiritually authentic and intellectually honest. So I really think about that book as a starting point in my becoming a thoughtful Jewish adult. Um, I'm going to suggest perhaps in the springtime that Avram teaches that book to those of you who might be interested in reading and studying. It's not an easy book to read, but it is an incredibly worthwhile book to read. And for people who struggle uh, theologically, struggle with an idea of how God might be in their life, um, Rabbi Artson has some really wonderful insights. And I'm going to suggest that maybe in the spring um, or in the late winter uh, that um, we study that with you. I would love that. Michelle. So my book um, that was the most impactful to me, I actually read when I one summer when I was a counselor at camp. So whatever reading means when you are simultaneously taking care of 14-year-olds 24-7. But um, that book was Man's Search for Meaning. And the something that was really a big part of my role, my leadership roles in camp was purpose and starting with the why and making sure that with everything that you did, whether it was a program or a conversation or a teaching that you wanted to do, that there was always a purpose and that was the foundation for everything that you were doing and that is a big theme in his book, in Viktor Frankl's book and when you have purpose and you know why you're doing something and why and how that is fulfilling to you, you are able to keep going and you don't feel lost and you have um, the will to keep on pursuing what it is that you want to be achieving. And I think that that is something that not just from camp, but also from this book has really been ingrained in me and not just as a human being, but also in my work. Um, making sure that there's always a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing, like bigger picture and also smaller scale, whether it's like the individual programs or just in general, what are the goals that I have for the youth department over this year, for two years, five years, um, and also week to week when I'm meeting with the teens, just making sure that I know the purpose and that purpose is... Um, conveyed through my teens as well. Um, how many of you have um, had a chance in your life to read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning? So if you haven't, I would strongly encourage you to read it. It's uh, 
really, he was a um, Auschwitz survivor. And the core of the book is the question, why did some people survive Auschwitz and others didn't? And how much of it is about the physical reality around us or the interior of our mental state and our attitude that allows us to move beyond? Um, definitely a worthwhile book. David. Yes, sir. Um, I have a few books. Um, well, uh, just what you said just made me also think of The Sunflower, um, deeply impactful book and broadening my thinking about forgiveness. Um, but I wasn't thinking about that. Um, uh, the Source, I would consider by James Michener. James Michener, I don't think, is a Jewish author, but I think The Source is a Jewish book. Um, and talk about a page turner that I didn't expect to be a page turner. Um, if you haven't read it, it's about an archaeological dig at a tell in Israel. And um, it goes through history level by level. It's a work of fiction um, from uh, like 10,000 um, BCE through the modern era. And I think it's amazing. It's an amazing survey of history. Um, and opened my eyes to trends in Jewish life that what we're experiencing now is not particularly new. Um, and that leads me to As a Driven Leaf, um, if you've read it, um, which helped me understand that what we're experiencing now in the Jewish world is not particularly new. Um, I'm talking about um, uh, assimilation, anti-Semitism, you know, all, all of it. This is, this is not something we've just started dealing with. Um, one more, The Yeshiva by Chaim Grada, um, translated from Yiddish. Um, amazing work of fiction. Um, who, it was recommended to me by Rabbi Artsin, who we were just talking about. Um, it's basically a Jewish Star Wars, but instead of um, Jedis and Sith Lords, it's rabbis um, in old world, like Ukraine, Poland. It's amazing. I would highly recommend it. Yeshiva, the Yeshiva by Chaim Grada, or it's called Semach Atlas in Yiddish, if you read Yiddish. Wow. A book that I haven't read that I'm going to have to pick up and read. Um, the source was the reason why I started to keep kosher um, fully in my life after I read that when I was 16 years old. If you haven't read The Source, it's a great book. If you haven't read The Sunflower by Simon Wiesenthal, it's really a wonderful book. Um, and of course, um, as a driven leaf, this congregation knows that many times I have talked about it and taught it over the years. Um, we're going to ask one more question, um, and then we're going to turn it over to all of you. If you could meet um, a Jewish historical figure um, and ask a question to that individual, who would it be and what question might you ask? Michelle, can we start with you? So I would meet Golda Meir. I think that she was and still is, although she's not alive, but um, a very powerful woman um, who knew what she wanted and what she was fighting for and what her purpose was um, and really paved the way for the state of Israel, for future leaders, um, and especially now as I find my way and my role in, as a Jewish professional and a Jewish educator, having a strong female role model or historical figure is important. And um, yeah, that's, oh, my question. Um, my question, I would ask her how she would shape um, modern Israel education for youth in the 21st century. Um, so they, to have them grow up feeling like they have a well-rounded education and knowledge on Israel being in America. Very nice. Um, David, which historical figure, what question? I would meet Rashi. Um, 
because for, for two reasons. First reason, he is a pedagogue and a great one. And I like to collect good teachers. And his commentaries are great teachers, but I'm sure he was a better teacher. And um, I would ask him, who was your teacher? And I w I w tell me about your, your Rebbe. Um, I want to hear about that. And then also because um, I think he made wine on the side. And um, I would ask him, uh, where's the good stuff? I want the, <laughs> I don't want the boiled stuff. Give me the good stuff. Um, that reference was uh, Yain Mivushal, that not all kosher wines, but many kosher wines um, are flash pasteurized through um, a extreme heat. Um, there are plenty of really good kosher wines that you don't have to get Mivushal. They're just a little harder to get. Um, he did not flash pasteurize and burn his wine before drinking it. That's for sure. Um, Avram. I, th I think we're going to have to go with uh, Gershom Sholem. Uh, that may be a familiar and unfamiliar name, but he was a 20th century academic and, and researcher who basically single-handedly created the academic study of Kabbalah. The, the field remained in obscurity for a very, very long time. And he, he was ridiculed and he was laughed at that, you know, this is... This is fairy tale stuff, like why are you spending your time researching this? But the work that this man did to categorize and systematize and uncover and translate just the sheer number of publications that he was able to do in his lifetime, and any academic study, any book basically that has been written about Kabbalah in our lifetimes, in some way goes back to him. Now, the interesting thing about him is it's very unclear if, like, he was an academic, and so there isn't any mention at all about whether this was purely an academic discipline for him or whether he was a practicing Kabbalist. But in one of, it's an essay collection or a journal collection, something like that, I don't, I don't remember the name off the top of my head, there's a, a very obscure passage, like two lines, and the entry says something along the lines of, today I finally achieved it. And that's it. That's the only entry. And so my question to him would be, what happened on that day? Um, I asked those last two questions with purpose because I also would invite each one of you to think about what book, Jewish book, or Jewish author has influenced you significantly? Um, is there a Jewish book, a Jewish author that has influenced you? Um, and what Jewish historical figure would you want to meet with? And what question would you ask that individual? So um, I think there are good questions to think about. And while you're sitting and having lunch today, um, with hopefully people that you don't know and you're looking forward to meeting, maybe you can use those questions as an opportunity to get to know one another uh, a little more deeply. Natalie has a microphone, and if there's a question that you have for the three, um, she's going to bring the microphone over. I just I want to be conscientious of time. It's 12. I want to end services about 12.15. Um, so we'll take a, a few questions. Um, and, um, and then we'll be quick with the answer so we can get as many as possible. Rabbi Kirsch, yes. Oh, the, I'll repeat it. Ask the question, I'll repeat it. So Rabbi Kirsch wants to know from Michelle, what are some of her plans and ideas to draw the teens in to Jewish life here at Shomrei and Temple Aliyah and beyond? That's a question I can answer. Thank you. Um, I would like to, I mean, we have a really strong turnout right now on our weekly 
lounge events um, and with all the chagim that felt like they were drawn out for months, it was a little hard to get more activity or more involvement from them. Um, but hopefully starting to have monthly, if not twice a month, Shabbat meals at here or Aliyah and then being part of the service on Friday night as well, um, having a lot of um, holiday centered programming as well, getting them involved in volunteer opportunities in, uh, in the community, whether it's at either of the shoals or out in, in the community, um, also having a lot of fun. Um, Jew having fun is also Jewish. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know. Fun things. I don't know if you want more specifics than that, but she actually organized for this coming Tuesday, Shelley, um, CBS Morning Show is going to be here filming. Um, they wanted to talk with some teens about uh, Kanye West and other examples of anti-Semitism that we're facing in our community today, the 405, for example. And so the teens who are here right now, um, this Shabbat morning, some others um, are going to be gathering through Michelle's uh, arranging to have this conversation. It will be on TV. We'll let you know um, when it's going to be aired. Um, other questions? You're not, I don't know. Yell, yell it out. Um, she's, a, she's a teacher, so you can tell that she has the voice. Excellent question. Um, yeah, you, any of you can just jump in. I'll start. Um, I, ha I have two, two goals right now. Um, I would like to, one of my goals as, as a Jewish educator um, is to um, teach fundamentals. Um, which means fundamentals of Hebrew reading, fundamentals of um, Torah reading um, to youth and to um, adults. I think everyone can benefit from skills, and most people enjoy learning skills. This includes young people, too. Um, so I think skill-based learning is really important to me. Um, also, I want to be involved in more than I am now, more uh, creative musical projects. Um, and I'd like to have um, a recorded album by this summer. So I'll keep you posted. I just said that out loud in public for the first time. So now <laughs> I'm accountable. Um, be accountable. So perhaps um, if some of you have always had an inkling to participate in um, Shabbat services but have been afraid, either your Hebrew is not great um, which you should see Barbara Clarissenfeld to help you, or your davening skills and you don't know how to turn your Hebrew into the music of the service, maybe you can approach David and ask to do a little bit of learning. And if you um, have read Torah once in your life a long time ago or have never read Torah but would like to brush up or learn that skill because we're always desperate for new Torah readers, maybe you can see David. Please talk to me. Um, and practice those skills. The other two of you, do you have an answer to that question? I think if, if we're to take the Midrash um, seriously, or take this idea seriously that, that everybody, every Jew was present at Sinai, within the course of, of time, every Jew was there, that means that everybody who is Jewish has this tradition as their birthright. And when I say every Jew, I'm not interested in conservative or orthodox or reconstructionist or, or reform or renewal. I mean all of them. And so I feel as though it's my, my goal is to be in a position to help, to not help, because help, help implies that the person can't do it on their own, to support others 
in their exploration of Judaism in order to craft a relationship with Judaism that is authentic to their lived experience and also fits within the larger context of the community that they're living in. And I also believe that there's no Judaism, there are only Judaisms, and that each person who is Jewish, it's their responsibility to craft an authentic relationship with this tradition. And I want to be in the position to be a part of that process for both individuals and a community. My answer is very similar to Avram's. I think that it's really important to grow up and feel confident in your relationship with Judaism, even if that looks different from the person that's sitting next to you. And my youth are in a very crucial time in their lives where they can really be exploring that in many different ways and figuring out what is meaningful to them now, maybe wasn't meaningful to them a year ago or won't be in three years from now, and feeling comfortable exploring that and ultimately feeling confident in their expression of Judaism, whatever that looks like. Great question, great answers. Yeah. So the question was, how does um, Avram, um, he was directing it specifically to Avram, how do you come up with the way in which the Torah that you're going to teach has some resonance um, with the people who are listening so that you can draw them in to the idea in Torah, but do it in a thoughtful and you know, interesting or creative way? So there, there are a couple principles that I follow for that. First off, it's a, it's a great question. It's going to force me to articulate my process. I think the first piece is whatever it is, it has to be relatable and applicable. And right, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how much, it does matter, like it matters how much you study, but if I came up there and inundated everyone with all the other midrashim about the Tzohar that weren't relevant, or what other um, rabbis said about the topic, right? it's not a book report. And I think oftentimes people fall into this trap of either making it a book report or feeling like this is my one shot to show how much information I know on the subject, and it misses the point. Because, as you said, the point is to connect. And I believe that the w my way, at least, of doing that is to find the middle ground between these lofty ideas, right? We, like today we were talking about this, this stone that contains the light of creation that was given to Adam by, you know, this angel. Okay, right? But we started with stuff with tchotchkes on a, on a bookshelf. You know, the, the angels and the stones and the lights and the mysticism, it has to be grounded in this reality. And the things that we teach, regardless of whether you're a rabbi or not, has to be grounded in the everyday and to look deeper and to see that those ideas are contained within the things that we often just pass by. Um, and really all that looks like, the other piece to that for me is when I open the text and I read, I think about, I, actually I don't think, I just read. And I become aware of what is the, like what do I snag on in the text and I begin following it, and it's, it's like following, you know, going down the rabbit hole of like, how far can I take this thing? And sometimes it's a dead end and I have to start over. But I get a feeling when I know I'm in the groove. Yeah.
Ralph, I I, I want to I want to um, I just want to cut. I don't want to cut you off, but I'm going to cut you off only because of the time. Um, and there's two more questions that I want to get to, and I want to make sure that people get to lunch. So I do want you to have the continue the conversation, but just to be respectful of because I want to uh, get a quick last question from Judy and Let's from um, John. Um, yeah. Okay, so the question is, when you're not focused on your professional career, what do you love to do for fun? David. Um, first and foremost, I have two cats, and um, uh, I like to play with my cats. Um, the second thing, um, I love to play softball, and um, I played for a Sinai Temple softball team, and I played for a Dot Shalom softball team, and I'm looking forward to playing for Shomre Torah's softball team. So I'd like to see you all out there for our first game. I don't know what it is, but I'll let you know. Not to be confused with the upcoming Shomre Torah Bowling League. <laughs> Michelle, what do you do for fun? Um, I really enjoy shopping, right, Rabbi Cameras? <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy shopping, and I really enjoy cooking and baking, um, and that was something that really got me through quarantine when I was really bored, as I'm sure most of you had a lot of time in the kitchen, um, and I could never forget playing with my childhood dog, Pepper. She's a cutie and my favorite. <laughs> Avram. So I, I love to cook, actually. Um, that's sort of my, my zen space. Um, so any anytime I can get in the kitchen uh, and throw some music on and start uh, just, just making something, uh, I'm pretty happy. So, you know, if it's a long day, like sometimes people feel that it's inconvenient to, oh, like I have to cook dinner now. For me, that whatever period of time that is, like that's actually my decompression time. He is a fantastic cook. <laughs> John, last question. <laughs> okay, early memory that something silly that you can hold, that you hold on to. Um, who wants to start that question? That's a tough question. Wow. I can start. Um, I was at uh, my friend's house. We were maybe six, seven years old, and he had an orange tree, and thought it would be fun to throw oranges over the house, because that's what you do. And um, he threw an orange at the window by accident, and it. I remember it, it splattered all over the window, <laughs> and his mom ran out, and it was like, what are you doing? Um, thanks for asking that question. I haven't thought about that for years. <laughs> yeah, that, that also unlocked some sort of core, core memory. Um, I, remember going, I remember going to the Philly Zoo when I was a little kid, and we went to the Gorilla Sanctuary. And, you know, I was small enough that I was weaving in, in between people and I got right up to the window and there's this huge silverback male gorilla sitting in front of the window, right? Just like leaning up to the side, hanging out. And I don't know from nothing, right? So I'm looking at him and he's looking at me and we're making eye contact. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> But I was curious, and like my curiosity definitely gets me into trouble sometimes. But this time it paid off. For some reason, I had the idea to pretend to start picking my nose. And this male silverback gorilla is looking at me, and he starts picking his nose too. <laughs> and so it was just this fascinating moment of like communi nonverbal communication of the most ridiculous thing. <laughs> Michelle? Um, I don't know, it's not that silly, but I have a twin brother, 
and we grew up before we moved in, um, we shared a room when we were younger, and um, we had like beds that were right next to each other, and whenever we were like supposed, like we were supposed to be going to sleep or whatever in the morning or not doing this, we would be like making obstacle courses from like our each other's beds and like holding the blanket and putting pillows in between each other's beds and my brother got hurt one time and that wasn't funny but it was a funny time and I don't know it was fun to think of that and then when we moved we were really sad about not sharing rooms and the second we moved we never looked back and have not shared a room since. <laughs> um. Well, thank you, the three of you, for giving us a little bit of insight into who you are, and I think it's so important for our community, and I want to thank, I don't remember whose suggestion this was, was it, was it Judy's, uh, Groner, so I want to thank Judy Groner for this idea. Um, really helpful to be able to connect more deeply to these three individuals who are going to be playing a significant role, already have, in shaping our community and the people, and hopefully each one of you will get to know them individually and personally um, and grow with them and from them over the course of the year or two years um, because hopefully we'll be blessed with uh, continuity with um, some of them over the course of beyond this year. 